For this morning, we're going to be here in John chapter 5, so if you'll take your Bibles and go to John chapter 5. If you're new here to Cornerstone, we, we go straight through the Bible cover to cover, and then we start over and do it again. And so we're here in our journey through the Bible in John chapter 5, and I'm going to read the first nine verses. John 5, starting at verse 1. It says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, and then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Verse 5, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. Let's pause there and pray. Lord, we thank you for this time together in your word as we just set our, our hearts, Lord, to hear from you. We pray, Lord, that whatever busy week we've had prior to coming here to your house today, that we will just lay all that at your feet and just focus on your word and be receptive to what you would say to us by your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege and the freedom of worshiping here. Bless our time in your word. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, like the previous two Sundays, if you've been here, two weeks ago, we talked about the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. Last week, we talked about the conversation that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman. And I mentioned that those two conversations were unique to the Gospel of John, not found anywhere else in the Bible outside of John's Gospel. The same is true about this story. We come to this uh, encounter that Jesus has with this paralyzed man, and this story is found only here in John's Gospel. I've mentioned to you through the course of going through John's Gospel thus far that John mentions the fewest number of Jesus' miracles compared to the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, but, and, and he only mentions eight, John only mentions eight, but of those eight, six are unique to John's Gospel, not found anywhere else. And this is one of those miracles. It's found only here in John's Gospel. And so let me just kind of go through this story with you, and then I've got two angles, two kind of perspectives to this story that I'll be sharing with you near the end. But let's just first understand what's happening here. The story takes place, verse 1 tells us, in Jerusalem. It says that Jesus has gone there for one of the Jewish feasts. Now, it doesn't say which one in particular. We can assume that it was one of the three major feasts that every Jewish male, 21 years and older, was required to make pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate. And those three feasts were Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacle. So it was probably one of those. And Jesus is here in Jerusalem. And we find that this story takes place, it says, near the Sheep Gate. Now, there were different gates around the walled city of Jerusalem. The Sheep Gate was located on the northeastern part of the wall. And it was the gate through which a men would bring their sheep for sacrifice at the temple. There was one designated gate to bring in your sheep. You don't just haul lamb chops through any, any gate willy-nilly. You're going to bring them through the sheep gate. So this story takes place in the northern quadrant of the city of Jerusalem, near the sheep gate. And it tells us that near the sheep gate, there's a pool there, a freshwater pool that is um, serviced by a freshwater spring underground. And it's called the Pool of Bethesda. Now, Bethesda in Hebrew, it's just an English transliteration of two Hebrew words, Beit Hesed. Beit Hesed means house of mercy. So now picture this. I don't think it's coincidental that the man who needed mercy is going to find mercy from the lamb near the sheep gate in a pool called mercy. 
This is a wonderful picture here of just the, the compassion of Jesus, the healing virtue of Jesus, all coming together in this one merciful moment to bring healing to this unnamed guy who has been an invalid for 38 years. Now, for the longest time, Bible scholars and archaeologists questioned whether John was making up this story. And the reason was because the Pool of Bethesda was not discovered. It was unknown in terms of its location. For centuries, liberal theologians and unbelievers dismissed this story as made up, and then it contributed to the idea that perhaps the whole Gospel of John is not really reliable, because if he's writing about a pool that doesn't exist in Jerusalem, then perhaps his whole book should be brought into question. Uh, and so that was the thought for centuries. We're not really sure if John's a reliable eyewitness. He talks about this pool of Bethesda in, verse, in chapter 5, and there is no pool of Bethesda, not near the Sheep Gate at least. Well, then there was this wonderful discovery in the late 19th century. In 1888, a German archaeologist by the name of Conrad Schick, he discovered the pool of Bethesda. I just love it when archaeology and or science eventually catches up with the Bible. Don't you love that? <laughs> Upon further excavation in 1956, archaeologists unearthed a rectangular pool with a portico on each side and a fifth portico dividing two rectangular pools that were somewhat terraced right there near the Sheep Gate that they've identified as the Pool of Bethesda. And having these five porches around the four perimeters and then one in between that divided the two rectangular pools, it fits exactly with verse 2, which tells us that the pool had five porches. And so they've discovered it now, and this, this pool is huge. It's huge. The first time I went to Israel uh, in 1998, uh, I expected to find a pool of Bethesda that was something little, like you'd find a kiddie pool at a community pool. You know, something shallow, something relatively small. And um, instead, I was shocked when I saw a huge pool. And they haven't even completely unearthed this pool because it stretches under what is today the Arab quarters. And they're not going to go, you know, demolishing Arab houses in order to figure out how far this thing goes. Just what they have uncovered. These two rectangular pools combined, listen to me, larger than an Olympic-sized swimming pool. What they have uncovered larger than an Olympic-sized swimming pool. On one end of this, of this pool, it's 42 feet deep. Okay, it's huge. Here's a, a picture. It's dry now because they've diverted the freshwater spring, um, but, so it's dry. But what you're looking at, this is kind of like a combobulation of just ruins. Well, it is, because here's, here's what's inside the Pool of Bethesda now. When you go to Israel, and this is actually one of the places we stop, on our tour, and by the way, a lot of you and our online viewers have signed up for the tour in March. We already have over 500 people that are going, so, uh, but we're going to go twice in 23, so we'll announce another one this fall for, for the fall of 23 as well. But um, this, this pool is a place where we stop and have this Bible study, so those of you who are going are getting the advanced Bible study. Those of you who can't go are going to get it now. Um, what you see inside this pool are the ruins of an ancient Byzantine church that was built over the site in the fifth century AD to commemorate this miracle from John chapter five. During the Byzantine empire in the fifth century AD, they built this church, which was then demolished when the Persians made another invasion of Israel in 614 AD. The Persians demolished the church, so what you see now are just the ruins inside the pool from the, from the Byzantine period that commemorates this miracle from John chapter 5. And I, I want you to get a sense of when you see this visually and, and when you hear the description, I want you to get a sense of the enormity, the size of this pool because it helps us to understand the dynamics of this story. In particular, verse 3. 
Because verse 3 says, a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, used to lie around this pool. Well, that, that changes the whole dynamic of this story if you think it's just a little kitty-sized pool. You might be thinking a couple of people, maybe a dozen, maybe a little bit more. No, no. The Bible says here that a great multitude of the sick and the lame and the diseased used to lay around this pool, and it's bigger than an Olympic-sized swimming pool. So that gives perspective to this story here. And by the way, when it says in verse 3, a great multitude used to lie there, how many is a great multitude? Well, it's, it's, it's not numbered for us. But comparatively speaking, we can look at a couple of other places in the Bible and see when that phrase, a great multitude, was used. One is in Matthew 15. In Matthew 15, at the feeding of the 4,000, Matthew records there was a great multitude, and then he ends up numbering it 4,000 men. And when you add women and children, it was probably a miracle of like eight or 10,000 people, not just four, that only counted the men. Mark, similarly, in Mark chapter 6, when he describes the feeding of the 5,000, he also says it was a great multitude. And again, that only counted the men. When you add women and children, it might have been more like 10,000, 12, or more. So if you use that same terminology now here in John's gospel to describe the number of sick and lame and diseased and paralyzed lying around this Olympic-sized swimming pool, it is possible that there were literally thousands of people lying around this pool. I want you to imagine it. Now we'll come back to that, but I want you to understand the whole picture here. Let me point out verse 4 in our story, because some of your Bibles don't have verse 4. And when I was reading it, you're like, what's he reading? This isn't even in my Bible. Verse 4 says, For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, and then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Um, King James also has verse 4, as I just read it, but uh, other Bibles do not have verse 4. If you have an ESV, if you have an NIV, it, it omits verse 4. In fact, in your Bibles, if you have one of those versions that omits it, it just has verse 3, and then it numbers verse 5, and you're looking right now like there is no verse 4. How many of you have no verse 4 in your Bibles? Okay. So you're like confused when I'm reading this. And earlier, you're like, where is he? He's like, he's not even in my Bible anymore. Well, that's because you have an inferior Bible. That's why. I, <laughs> no. No. It, it's not an inferior Bible. Let me tell you why it's missing. Some ancient manuscripts of the Bible did not have that verse, and some ancient manuscripts did. And, and so those who were, you know, a part of modern translations decided to, in an abundance of caution, like we're going to err on the side of omitting it since in some of the ancient manuscripts that verse is not found, although in some it is found. So in an abundance of caution, some translations of the Bible don't have it because it's not found in all the manuscripts. Either way, it doesn't change the story. It doesn't change the meaning, intent, and purpose of the story. So it's not corrupt either way if you don't have it or if you do have it. I'm going to tell you, and this is just purely my opinion, I'm going to tell you why I think it's good for it to be included in the Bible. I'm going to give you two reasons. First of all, because obviously some kind of miraculous thing was happening here. Some kind of miraculous thing was happening here in these waters being stirred, providing some kind of miraculous cure for sick people, because people would lie around this pool day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And I guarantee you, if nothing miraculous was happening, people wouldn't be lying around the pool. Eventually, people would look at each other like, it's not happening. Is it happening for you? It hasn't been happening. It hasn't happened for years. Let's go home. That's what they would do. So something clearly is miraculously happening in the waters for people to trample over one another to get in there first. And it's got to be more than just Epsom salt baths here, friends. It's, it's got to be more than just some medicinal prop. You know, you could read commentaries and they're like, well, it's an underground spring and it bubbled up and wasn't really being stirred by angels and it was just medicinal, maybe some sulfur thing or Epsom. Okay, whatever, maybe. I, I don't know because it's not specific here, but... Clearly, something miraculous is happening. It had to be more than just some kind of medicinal properties of the water. Otherwise, people wouldn't sit around just taking a bath. Like, they'd be out of there. They're rushing in 
because something miraculous is happening in the moment. It appears to be random. It doesn't appear to be scheduled. It appears to be at different times and people are just poised, ready to go. They get their miracle, off they go. And then it seems to suggest that a new, peop- a new group of people cycle in and they're, and they're fighting over getting in the water. So clearly something is happening here. Secondly, while this might seem like something strange and peculiar to us, The idea that could God actually send an angel, stir up the waters, and then there's healing miraculous virtue within the waters? That seems strange and peculiar. But don't dismiss it because it might seem strange and peculiar. Because there are a lot of things in the Bible historically that God has done that to us seem strange and peculiar. Including various ways that God decided to heal people in unique ways. Example. 2 Kings chapter 5, we have the story of a man named Naaman. He's a Syrian general. He has leprosy. Leprosy was an incurable disease at the time. It's called Hansen's disease now. Only in the last like century and a half have, has there actually been a cure for leprosy uh, using the cocktail of a few different antibiotic treatments. But in that day, in 2 Kings 5, completely incurable. Debilitating, eventually you die from it. Naaman had leprosy. What did God tell him to do? Go to the Jordan River, dip yourself seven times. He argued with the prophet of God. He said, what are you you kidding me? I got cleaner rivers in Syria than here in the Jordan. I'm not going to dip myself. It's like, you want a miracle or not? It's like, okay. And so there he is seven times, you know. And he's a, he's a dignified general, like this feels like a little awkward, you know, like I've got to be doing this little Bob thing. Yeah, but he got his miracle because that's the way God determined to heal him. Dip yourself seven times in the Jordan. There's another story in Numbers chapter 21. I referenced this a few weeks ago when we were in John chapter 3 because Jesus referred to it. In Numbers 21, it's a story of when the Israelites were rebelling against God And so God said, okay, I'm going to get your attention. And he sends venomous snakes throughout the camp and the wilderness. Remember this? And these snakes started biting the Israelites. They started dying. And then guess what? You get bit a few times by and see your friends dropping dead from poisonous snake bites. You're going to get right with God quick, you know? And so like all the other people like Moses pray for us. We don't want to die. Moses intercedes and God says to Moses, okay. And it's a little unconventional, but it's what God said. I want you to take a fashion a snake out of bronze, put it up on the pole, lift the pole up, and everybody who looks at that will be healed and you won't die from the venomous, venomous snake bite. Now, Jesus referred to it in John 3 because he's referring to the fact that that was a picture of when he would be lifted up on a cross, everybody who looks to Jesus will be saved. All right? But God used that rather unconventional thing in Numbers 21 to bring healing to the Israelites. Also, in Isaiah chapter 38, there's a story of when King Hezekiah is sick, he's dying, and he has an infected boil somewhere on his body, and God instructs the prophet Isaiah, make a poultice, like this, like this uh, formula out of figs, put it on the boil, and Hezekiah will recover. That's exactly what happened. So, I think it's quite possible that when you look at this story here in John chapter 5, it's quite possible that God could have stirred these waters for the unique purpose of healing large masses of people out of His compassion and love for the sick and the lame. It may have been God's gracious provision for sick people in that day for a time. But a word of caution. Every practice in the Bible is not necessarily to become a pattern. Every practice in the Bible is not necessarily to become a pattern. Just because God may have uniquely healed people in this way doesn't mean we go out, okay, John chapter 5 and angels stirring the water. Let's go out and plant a church and call it First Church of the Healing Waters. No, you don't need to do that. And you don't need to stand at the community pool either and pray that God would send angels and stir up the water and then we're going to just throw in disabled people. No, like, I, like stop that. Like every practice in the Bible is not necessarily to become a pattern. There are patterns, all right? In terms of healing for the sick, there's a pattern in James chapter 5. It instructs the elders of the church to anoint them with oil and to pray over the sick. That's a pattern. That's what we do here. 
So that's what we'll do. We pray for people who are sick. We anoint them with oil. That's James chapter 5. I don't go slapping Fig Newtons on people just because Isaiah did that, right? Because that's a unique thing that God did. Every practice is not necessarily a pattern. So whether or not you, you want to include verse 4 in your Bibles or not, it doesn't, it doesn't make a material difference to the story itself. The fact of the matter is people were getting some kind of miraculous healing in these waters. Otherwise, they wouldn't still be lying around these waters year after year after year. God was doing something here. Among the great multitude lying around this pool was this man. He's not named. We don't know his name. What we do know is that he has suffered from some debilitating condition for 38 years. And whatever it was, it was so debilitating that whenever the waters were stirred up, he couldn't get himself into the water without help. Can you imagine? You, you've had this infirmity for 38 years. You think the only cure is to get into this water and everybody is trampling over you to get their miracle. Can you imagine how like discouraging and hopeless this guy must have felt? to be sick like this for 38 years and everybody else is elbowing you and trampling over you to get into the waters. So here he is in this helpless condition. And in verse six, look in your Bibles, Jesus comes along, sees the guy and he asks him a very important question, which initially when you look at this question, you might think you're like, why did he even bother asking this? But this is what Jesus asks in verse six. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? Now, we might read that and think, why would he even ask that? Of course, this guy's been paralyzed for 38 years. Who wouldn't want to be made well? Why, why is he even asking the question? I tell you why Jesus is asking the question. And this is a truth statement. There are some people, friends, who simply don't want to be made well. What do I mean? Somebody hurt them, and they want to be bitter. I want to hold a grudge. I don't want to forgive that person. See, they, they don't want to be made well. They like being bitter. They like being angry. They like holding a grudge. There are some people who would rather gossip so that others think that they are in the know with all that they're gossiping about rather than keeping their mouth shut. They don't want to be made well. They like gossiping. There, there are people who would rather die in their sins than get right with God. They don't want to be made well. They like their lifestyle. There are a lot of people in the world like this. They like being angry. They like being bitter. They like being unforgiving. They, they, they like having their fun, even if it, you know, is rebelling against God. They like it that way, and they don't want to be made well. I, boy, I hope that is not you. I hope that every time that the Lord kind of, you know, our life is like an onion, and, and slowly God peels back layer after layer. And I hope that when he peels back certain layers in your life and, and it exposes different things about your heart, that, that you want God to help you instead of just deciding I'm fine the way I am. Don't, don't enjoy being sick. Do you want to be made well? I hope all of us would say, yes, Lord, I want to be made well. I want to be healed of this. I want to be helped with that. I want to be forgiven of this. So Jesus asked a very pointed question that I think all of us should ask ourselves. Do we really want to be made well? And this guy did. But this guy thought the only way to be made well was to get into the pool. And so that's his answer in verse 7. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, verse 8, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And Jesus just spoke the word. He just spoke the word, pick up your mat and walk. And instantly this guy was healed. Now, there's actually a lot more to this story that I didn't even read with you at the beginning of the Bible study. And the reason is because I felt led as I was preparing for the study to just look at two different perspectives about this story. There's so much more here, but I just felt led that this morning we're just going to look at these two different perspectives. And the first perspective is from a pastoral perspective on ministry. 
that I, I think will be helpful for you to understand. And the other perspective is this human perspective that all of us can relate to. There's this human element in here that we cannot miss that all of us, I'm sure, can relate to at some level. I'm gonna start with the first perspective, this first angle, which is in relation to pastoral ministry. And I, I hope that you will not hear this as anything self-serving because I honestly share this with you to help you understand what ministry should look like. And ministry doesn't always look like what we think it should look like. Some of us have come to church with a certain church background, a certain church perspective, and we look at ministry through that church lens. And I'm going to ask you to just kind of remove whatever lens you might have had up to this point and kind of have a fresh perspective of what is ministry supposed to look like. Again, not to be self-serving, but I think it'll help you. And also, I thought about people who may be going into the ministry in the future, people watching online who might be in the ministry presently. This, I think, is helpful for all of us. But I want to share from this first angle here. Uh, 31 years ago, uh, I started pastoring here at, at Cornerstone Chapel when all 18 charter members asked me to become the first pastor of this startup church. That was 31 years ago. I can't believe where time is gone. I was 11 years old at the time. <laughs> Couldn't even drive. It was hardly could shave. Anyway, <laughs> Terry and I had only been married a couple of years. We only had one child. Up to that point, it was Tyler. He was only one year old. I had never pastored a church. Uh, I had not completed uh, Bible college. I would years later. I had never been to seminary. And on top of all of it, I was a recovering Methodist. Okay? <laughs> Anybody else? Any other recovering Methodists? Hi, my name is Gary. Welcome to my support group. I'm thankful for my heritage. I have to say that I have Methodist pastors on both sides of my family. My great grandfather on my dad's side was a, a Methodist circuit rider preacher on horseback through the hills of West Virginia. Not making it up. That's why if you're from West Virginia, you're probably related to me. <laughs> but I can tell you that with that kind of a combination, like hadn't finished Bible college, hadn't been to seminary, newly married, uh, uh, one child, and, and um, it became painfully aware to me early on in the ministry just how inadequate I was in trying to meet everyone's needs. And that's what pastors attempt to do, try to minister to the flock, meet people's needs, meet people's needs. And the list is, is lengthy. You know, you, you spend time preparing the teachings, praying with people in need, visiting people in the hospital, going to dinners as we were invited, doing all the weddings, doing the funerals, counseling with people, taking the crisis calls in the middle of the night, arbitrating disagreements, and dealing with the disgruntled. And, and I can tell you that early on, in a few years into the ministry, I was just overwhelmed by it all. And on top of it, pastors can be so attentive to the needs of the flock that they can often neglect the needs of their own family. And I've been guilty of that at times. And one day, about seven or eight years into pastoring here at Cornerstone, and our, our church was still relatively small, uh, I just cried out to God. I was just like, Lord, I, I can't do this. This is too overwhelming. Human need and everything that everybody's going through. Legitimate needs, legitimate crises, legitimate things that people were going through would at times be overwhelming. And, and I thank God that over the years, you know, I've been able to hire staff to help supplement and complement um, what my gifts are not and vice versa. Um, but, but for any pastor, just the cry of the heart is, Lord, I, I can't do this. And I, I remember... Just, you know, not hearing an audible voice, but in the still small voice of the Lord speaking to my heart, you're right, you can't do this, but I can. And he took me to John chapter 5. This story became probably the most, uh, certainly the most pivotal uh, story in relation to helping me to be more centered in ministry but it just had a profound impact on, on my walk with the Lord and, and my understanding of what ministry is supposed to look like. And so in this story, what, what the Lord showed me is something that might be obvious to us, but it didn't translate for me until the Lord specifically showed me. I want you to again imagine, 
an Olympic-sized swimming pool with potentially thousands of people, a great multitude, however many that is, of the, of the sick, the lame, the diseased, the paralyzed, lying around this huge pool. Talk about human need, and all legitimate. I mean, people who are desperately sick and wanting a miracle and needing Jesus to touch them. But check this out, among all the potentially thousands who are around that pool, listen, Jesus stepped over all of them to go to the one guy to whom the Father directed him. That is very challenging in ministry. I read that and for the first time, like a light bulb went off, like, Lord, you mean what ministry is really about is I just need to be more tuned into you to be sensitive. Who should I minister to? Who should I not? Who should I pray with? Who should I not? Who should I go visit? Who should I not? Learning to say no, as much as I might say yes, whatever's in step with your will. Because check this out. Later in John 5, it's around verse 19, but you need to turn there. Jesus talks about how I don't do anything except the Father directs me and shows me what to do. In John 12, verse 49, later in John's gospel, Jesus says, I don't say anything except that the Father tells me what to say and how to say it. When you think about the ministry of Jesus and how laser focused he was and only doing what the Father told him to do and saying what the Father told him to say, I looked at that, I read this story and I said, Lord, help me to to have ministry like that. Like just tuned into what you want to happen, when and where, and, and Lord, just help me to understand as much as Jesus was completely tuned into the will of the Father, help me in a similar way. And so when I, when I thought of ministry this way, the Lord spoke to me about how you cannot, this is, this is important for ministry in general, whether you have full-time ministry or all of us have ministry, okay? You cannot be driven by the power of human need. You must be directed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and so I'm, I'm just going to put that up there as a point for us to, to see and to understand. Ministry can't be driven by the power of human need. It must be directed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord spoke to my heart, you're not responsible for everyone's needs. I am, the Lord says. You're just responsible to minister to people as I direct you and to lead them to me. And so this, this story spoke to me in, in that way. And it relieved me of a lot of the expectations I had put on myself and some of the expectations that others had put on me about meeting everybody's needs in the church. It just, it just can't. No pastor, including the pastors on our staff, and I'm very grateful for all of our pastors and all of our ministry leaders and support staff, but no one can meet all the human needs in any church. As, as wonderful as people can be and, and as wonderful as a staff that I have here at Cornerstone, our pastors, our counselors, our ministry leaders cannot meet all the demands of human need, as legitimate as the needs are. Our job is to love you, to teach you, and to shepherd you to a point but mainly to direct you to the one who can meet all your needs, and that's our great shepherd, Jesus. Amen? Does everybody understand that? Our pastors, our counselors, our ministry leaders are human too. We have our faults. We have our needs. We have families. We have trials. We have tears. We have temptations too. And we must not we will not and we cannot take the place of Jesus for you, but we will do our best to direct you to him. Amen. Ministry, someone once said like this, ministry is just one beggar helping another beggar to find bread. That's our job. We're just real people like you with the same struggles. We're just begging for bread and we're the bread of Jesus, and we're helping other beggars to find the same bread in Jesus too. So please don't idolize us. Please don't put us on pedestals. Please don't have unrealistic expectations. Pray for us. You understand the enemy works overtime on people in ministry. Pray for our families. Pray for our marriages. Pray for our kids. Pray for our church. Pray for us. I remember years ago when God started speaking this to my heart about, listen, just be focused on what I want you to do and don't 
try to run around trying to meet everybody's needs, okay? I remember when I first put this to test, I was just like really, I was reluctant. I was relieved that the Lord had shown me this. I was also reluctant because I knew, I knew that there would be some people who would not understand. So like this is like 25 years ago, okay, when the Lord first started showing me this stuff. First time I tested it. There was this dear lady in our church, not, not here any longer, and she came up to me and she said, Pastor Gary, um, I believe that uh, my husband and, and me and our kids are supposed to move to Virginia Beach. The Lord is just putting Virginia Beach on my heart. I, I believe we're supposed to move there. And I'd like you to pray with me to that end because um, I don't even want to tell my husband yet what the Lord has put on my heart. Would you pray with me that if it's the Lord's will, that he'll move my husband's heart and, and our kids and we'll go as a family. And as she's asking me this, this whole thing is going through my head like, okay, Lord, Jesus only did what you told him to do, say what you told him to say, and ministered where you told him to minister. Is this something you want me to do? And I'm just like quietly throwing that prayer up as she's talking to me. So she makes this request, which is like a normal request. Would you pray for me? I have a need. And as she's asking me, I felt in my heart the Lord say, do not pray with her. Ah, like I just like, oh, great, God. You know when like he tells you to do something, you're like, ah, I don't, I don't really want to do this. But I've asked. I've asked for you to help me with this. So she gets through asking this wonderful little, you know, prayer request. She said, so will, will you pray with me? And this is after church one day, about 25 years ago. I looked right in her eyes and I said, no, I will not. And she looked at me and she kind of like jolted back, like what kind of an unloving, unpastoral thing is that? That was in her facial expression. She didn't say it. I think it was, her eyes looked far worse than that, let me tell you. It's like, and, and she said, excuse me? And I said, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna pray with you. And she was mad and left the church, left the church. And I was just like, okay, Lord, you know, I can't wait till you try it again. I'm going to clean the whole church out. <laughs> and we, we only had a couple hundred people at the time. I'm just like, yeah, we'll pick them off one by one. I'm going to say, no, I'm not going to pray for you. No, I'm not going to minister to you. No, I'm not going to visit in the hospital. No, no, no. <laughs> Do you know about a month later, she came back to the church. She came up to me and she apologized. <laughs> she said, pastor, I have to apologize. I was angry at you. I was like, Really? No. <laughs> she said, I was mad at you because you wouldn't pray with me. She said, I went home. I told my husband, you wouldn't pray with me about this. And she said, you know what he said? I said, what's that? She said, that he said, well, I'll pray with you. She said to me, Pastor, my husband has never in our married life prayed with me, not once. He's never done Bible study with me, not once. She said he prayed with me about moving to Virginia Beach and that started something in his heart where he started wanting to do Bible study with me. He's been praying with me and doing Bible study with me since you told me no. Thank you for saying no to me. <laughs> yeah, praise God. So, thank you for your prayers, it's important. The other quick angle to this story and I've really already run out of time, but I'm going to do my best to summarize this second angle because it's an important human perspective to this story. So, okay, Jesus is directed by the Father to step over countless people to go to the one to whom the Father directed him to heal on that particular day. But what about everyone else? Why didn't anyone else get healed that day? Why didn't Jesus just say the same words out loud to everybody at the pool and everybody would have gotten up and been healed that day? These are the kind of questions that honest people wrestle with today. Why didn't my spouse get healed? Why didn't my child survive? Why didn't my marriage get restored? Why didn't my parents stay together? People asking things like, I mean, if God can do anything, why doesn't he do something for me? I'm sure that there were some people, plenty of people around the pool that day who saw this guy get his miracle and they were wondering, but what about my miracle? 
Am I not as important as this guy? Does God only care about the one and not about all the rest of us? Have you ever felt, maybe you haven't said it this way, have you ever felt stepped over in regards to your miracle? Like God did something for someone else but not for you? I don't want to shy away from the tough questions. And I get these kind of questions. And this is a real question when you look at this story. There were countless people who did not get a miracle that day. Only the one guy did. And you can wonder why, God? Why did you step over others and they were not healed and the one guy was? And I don't think it's a cop-out to say. In fact, I think it's important to admit we just don't know. There are some things in life this side of heaven we will not be able to understand. We will not be able to grasp with our human capacity to understand the heart and mind of God, why he does something miraculous for one person and not for another in a similar way, why he doesn't seem to answer this prayer, but he does answer that prayer. There are going to be plenty of things in the course of our lives that don't necessarily make sense this side of heaven. And we cannot get our theological underwear all twisted up by coming out with an answer for which there is no answer. And I've heard people, probably well-intentioned people, say things they might have been well-intentioned, but it was not well thought out. People who think they have to have an answer for situations that just don't have an answer this side of heaven. It's going to be tucked away in the heart of God, and we have to stop saying things to try to make an answer for something that doesn't have a human explanation. Example, I remember years ago, doing a funeral for a baby who had died of SIDS. And a well-intentioned lady who just hadn't well thought out her words said to the parents, well, you know, I'm sure Jesus just needed another angel in heaven. And I just, I wanted to leap across the casket and say to that lady, do you have any understanding the pain you just inflicted? Like, do you think that really helps? Well, Jesus just needed another angel back up in heaven. Like, why are we saying things like this? Why are we trying to come up with these theological or trite answers for things that we just have to admit, you know what, I don't, I, don't have, I don't have the magnitude of God's mind to understand his heart in all things. But here's what I do know, and this is an important takeaway from this, okay? When I don't understand God's ways, I have to cling to God's worth that he is good even when times aren't. That is important for every single one of us because if it hasn't happened already, there will likely come a time in your life where something happens or didn't happen that doesn't make sense to you. And it's easy to get angry with God. It's easy to question God. It's easy, it's easy to get you know, frustrated with God. And, and by the way, he can handle our emotions. You, you read the Psalms, there's plenty of raw emotion in the Psalms. I'm not saying like you can never get upset with God like his feelings are gonna get hurt. Like God understands our human capacity. He understands our human limitations. He gets our emotion. He created us. But when we are in those moments of frustration and feeling like I don't have an answer for this and why God, that's when we have to cling to his worth when we don't understand his ways and trust that because he's good, that's his worth. He is good. He is holy. He is just. He is righteous in all his ways. Then even when I don't understand, I'm going to trust him because he's a good God. When my times are not good, he still is good. So I have to defer and say, Lord, I don't get it, and I don't pretend to get it. And this hurts, and this is confusing, but nevertheless, I trust you because you're good. And so even though this side of heaven, I may not understand it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean into you, and I'm going to trust you. Listen, this is what David did, and I'll close with this, out of Psalm 22. The first verse of Psalm 22, Jesus quotes on the cross. And this is what David wrote in Psalm 22, first five verses. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and am not silent. Listen, he says, but you are holy. You are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. What's he doing? He's saying, I don't understand. This doesn't make sense. I don't feel like you're even answering my prayers. But I know that you're good because you're holy and you're just and you're pure and you're enthroned on 
the praises of Israel, and he says, our fathers trusted in you, they trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. And that's where we have to get to. You know, Paul said to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, now I know in part, right? We only have a limited understanding and knowledge of what's happening in our world and in our lives. Now I know in part. He says, but then, one day when I'm with you, then I will know fully, even as I am fully known. Until then, we cling to God's worth and we press into him. And we trust him. In Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this story. So much more in that story, Lord, that we could have dug out. But we just thank you, Lord, for these two perspectives. And I pray right now for those who are just really clinging to you because some things have happened in their lives that don't make sense. They feel perhaps like others around the pool that day, like they've been stepped over. They didn't get their miracle. They've been stepped over. And Lord, maybe their miracle is still to come. And maybe not. Because there are some things we just don't understand, Lord. And it's okay for us to acknowledge that we don't always grasp what you're up to, why you did some things and not other things. We know in part. But one day... One day it'll make more sense when we're standing in your presence. We will know fully even as we are fully known. Until then, Lord, we press into you and we trust you. And I pray for a special measure of your grace today for those who just really need you, Lord. Those who have been hurting, those who have been struggling in their faith and trying to trust you in the midst of their pain. Lord, would you reveal yourself in a personal way to them, tenderly loving them through their trial reminding them that even though sometimes they might feel stepped over, you see them, you haven't forgotten them. And we trust you, Lord, because you are holy and you are enthroned on the praises of your people. We trust you, Lord. We thank you for your word in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you all.